Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Christ Church on this first Sunday of the season of Lent. My name is Edward Good, and uh, this is my first Sunday that I can say um, that uh, I am the installed pastor here at Christ Church. Um, we had a wonderful celebration of our shared ministry together this past Sunday. If you were not able to be with us, it is posted on our church website as well as on um, our church YouTube page. So. Uh, if you'd like to take a look at that, um, it was like, as, as I said, it was a wonderful, wonderful celebration. And we're excited about what is ahead for us as a community of faith. As we look ahead, one of the things we're going to be doing during this season of Lent is our focus is on um, asking a question that uh, makes us look at things in new ways. And that question is simply, what if? What if? where we're going to take these teachings and these stories that we get from the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to just, as I you know, said, ask the question, what if? What if we understood it in a different way? What if we explored it in a different way? What if we, we, we um, got to a deeper place with it than we've gotten before? Ultimately, through all of those, what our prayer is, is that it helps you come to see the truth of the story in a deeper way. So I'm excited about this journey that we have together as we go through this holy season in preparation for the celebration of Easter coming up in April. I am glad you are with us today, wherever you might be. And as our guiding statement is that we embrace all as we journey the way of Jesus, we embrace you wherever you are, grateful that you are here today. Grace, peace, love, and joy be with you as we worship together. if Jesus entered the wilderness not willing to give up that which sustained him? What if? What if Jesus responded to that first temptation by turning that large gray rock into a beautiful, warm, freshly baked loaf of bread and eating it all at once to satisfy his hungry stomach? What if? Rather than going back to the commandment of God, what if Jesus looked at all the kingdoms of the world and believed that the tempter had the power to hand all of those over to him. And then desiring that power that Jesus fell to his knees and bowed before the tempter. What if? What if Jesus stood at the pinnacle of the temple, looked down 150 feet below and believed the tempter that he would not be hurt if he jumped from that point? Thanks be to God that these are simply what ifs. And not the reality of the one who stood strong against the temptations in the wilderness, but instead showed us the way to receive, to worship, and to follow. Let us pray. God of revelation, unveil your kingdom in our midst. Show us who we truly are in you. Expose the illusions that distort our vision. Deliver us from temptations that contort our living. Open our eyes in this season, that resistance may be the secret of our joy, and our joy a sign of your shalom. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, 
be reading from uh, verses 1 through 13. Now, just a little bit about what's going on here. So we were ahead and further, further ahead in the Gospel of Luke in uh, the last couple of weeks, and we're jumping back to the beginning. It's kind of one of the traditional passages that begins the season of Lent. Now, contextually, what's happening around this story is just before this is the uh, genealogy that Luke gives about Jesus, but before that is the story of Jesus' baptism. If you remember, we looked at that a few weeks back. And in that baptism, there's this moment where this voice speaks down from the heavens and says to Jesus, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And, And it is with that that Jesus then goes out into the wilderness. And so that's where we start. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. And then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone as I please. For you then will worship me, or if you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem. And placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the word temptation. It's kind of a funny word because we can use it in the same word in very different contexts and has some really different weight to it. So let me give you a couple of examples that we'll keep coming back to during the sermon this morning. So let's say my family and I are having dinner one night and after we get done with dinner we decide, you know, let's go out to Grater's. Let's go get some ice cream. So we walk into Grater's and we're looking at all the the different flavors, and and I can't decide between a couple of different ones. And I decide, you know, I I say to my wife, you know, Amy, I'm tempted to get two scoops instead of one. Okay? So that's one way you can use the word. It's used in another context. Let's say there's a person who is struggling with addiction in their lives. We'll say they're a recovering alcoholic. And the day goes by, where like every trigger for that person to, to stop at a liquor store or stop at a bar gets triggered. And it's getting towards the end of the day and they're just being drawn, just thinking, I'm tempted to just, it's just one drink, just one drink, that's, that's all I want, right? Even while knowing that taking that one drink will not just be one drink, will send them into a spiral from which they're going to have to dig out from once again. Same word. Two very different contexts. The ice cream temptation and the addiction temptation. Or the destructive temptation. Maybe is a better way to put it. So what kind of temptations were these for Jesus? And was it just sort of like a casual, like, eh, I'm being tempted, but I'm going to resist? Or is it something that really was getting at the core of the person that Jesus was? Now, when you read the story, the Gospel of Luke, 
Frankly, it reads mostly like just the ice cream temptation. I mean, yes, it talks about how Jesus was famished when that first temptation came. But it doesn't sound like there's really any struggle with any of them. I mean, it's kind of the same pattern. The devil tempts Jesus with, you know, the, um, you know, food, or power, or protection. And Jesus responds with a scripture passage, and that's that. Sounds like there wasn't really much there, but what if? What if there was? And if there was, what does that mean about Jesus, and what does that mean for us? So that's what we're going to play with. We're going to play with this story a little bit. So the story tells of Jesus going out into the wilderness. Now, this is something when we read this, we're like, why would he go out in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil? What's the point of that? Well, in Jesus' time, as well as up to the current day, there are cultures where people will go out on these types of experiences to go out into the wilderness on their own to help grow, to help understand who they are, to mark a certain stage in life. Nelson Mandela wrote about this in his autobiography. This course of people growing up in South Africa, he and other young men were sent out into the wilderness for a period of time as a sign of their transition from being boys to becoming men. In native cultures here in North America, this is a practice that has been done, where people would go out in the wilderness for a time of vision and learning about themselves. Even still to this day, there are people, a book that I read by a man by the name of Bill Plotkin, he talks about these vision quests that he will lead groups of people on, where they will go out into the wilderness for a couple weeks on end to separate themselves and have these visions of who they are and to get deep within themselves for understanding and growth. So maybe there's something of that for this, for Jesus. And so Jesus goes out for this extended period of time. It may have been exactly 40 days, but it also might have been just simply that that was a way of speaking of an extended, significant period of time. So I don't know if Jesus was out there, you know, marking on a rock, you know, okay, 38 days, 39, I'm almost there. Or whether it just was this extended period until this time came. So Jesus goes out there for 40 days. By this time, this first temptation comes, Jesus is famished, right? Sounds like he's drinking something, but he's not eating. And so that first temptation comes. Now, again, the way it reads is just sort of like, okay, turn this rock into a loaf of bread. Jesus, you know, uh, responds back that, um, you know, one does, live, <clears throat> one does not live by bread alone. Boom, end of temptation. But what if? What if the temptation was not just the words that the tempter said to Jesus, but instead it was something else? Again, we're just playing here. What if? What if the temptation was a memory of a time where Jesus and his buddies were running around Nazareth, and as they ran by the, the, the baker's home in Nazareth, they could smell that fresh baked bread just coming out of that stone oven. And they kind of look in and they see these loaves of bread these pieces of bread that are just sitting there and they can see the steam rising off of them and they can just smell how good they smell. And then the baker, she, she looks and she sees these boys' faces poking up through a window. And rather than chasing them away, she says, come here, come here, come here. And, and she just gives them one and says, just take it, it's yours. And Jesus remembered out there in the wilderness as his stomach is growling, he's famished. He remembers how good that bread tasted. I don't know about you, but I love the taste of freshly baked bread. and The smell of it just... So what if the temptation was something like that? And that there was something legit happening within Jesus of looking at that stone and saying, I could do that. Who would know? No one would know. I could do that. But 
thanks be to God, he resists. But the tempter's not done. The tempter's got another temptation, and, and, and the way the story reads is it comes right afterwards. It may not have been, it may have been something that some period of time elapses, I, I don't know, but maybe this next temptation is a point where Jesus is, is, is really longing for his family and his friends. He's been out in the wilderness a long time. And he's missing them. He's thinking about them. Thinking about what they're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Begins to reflect on all the, the, the struggles and trials that are there for people of that time. The oppression under which they were living under the Roman Empire. The brutality and the violence that that empire used to enforce the rule. Jesus thinks of the, pow- the poverty and the poor. Thinks of the number of people who are needing to be healed and restored thinking of how all this could be changed and and knowing who he is, knowing that he has the power to do something about it right then and right there. That what the people are needing is they're needing the king. They're needing a new ruler, one who can rule over all of this, who can kick the Romans out. What if that's the temptation? Jesus knowing that he could do something about that, but also knowing that by doing that, he would be going away from the plan and the, the, the reason he was there in the first place. About getting at the root of the problems of who we are. To re- restore those, to forgive those, to cleanse those. And that was just taking that fast, immediate fix that wouldn't ultimately change the human heart. But Jesus can see it. He can see that new world. He can see how it could be changed just like that. And this isn't the only time this temptation comes to Jesus. In fact, there are other times in the gospel stories where Jesus is tempted to go this same path. The story of the feeding of the 5,000. After Jesus has fed this crowd, they want to take him by force to make him king. So Jesus could have gone along with them and said, yes, let's take care of this. Let's run the Romans out. But he doesn't. That story, he slips off by himself and avoids the crowd. Another time, Jesus speaks of how he has to go to Jerusalem, where he's going to be arrested and killed and and so forth. And Peter, one of his disciples, actually rebukes Jesus, like says to Jesus, no, you're wrong, that's not how this goes. And Jesus responds to Peter, no, you get behind me, Satan. And then finally in that garden, just before he's arrested, Jesus is praying, God, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. Let there be another way for this to take place. But ultimately, not my will, but your will be done. So that temptation, I mean, it had to have a sense of realness and depth to it. Jesus, though, once again, resists. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then finally, maybe at the very, the, the very end, Jesus, in one of the, this, this period of time out in the wilderness, Jesus may be at a place where he is, he is hungry, he's tired, maybe even almost a little bit delusional. Because as I've read about people who have gone on these kinds of experiences, that if you're out there for a long period of time, eventually things sort of fade away. Things, time begins to shift. Things aren't quite as clear as they once were. So maybe Jesus is out there at this point and he's he's tired, he's hungry, he's despairing. We're going to get to this more about this in just a moment. But Jesus may be feeling all of this stuff and Satan sees an opportunity. Sees an opportunity for this whole thing to end, to defeat Jesus, to defeat this plan that God has. And yeah, the story says that it was to, you know, go and throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple 150 feet down. Now, of course, God's going to lift you up. But maybe it's ultimately just this sense of Jesus giving up, giving up in the wilderness. Just close your eyes and don't wake up again. What if? What if? 
But with this last temptation, once again, Jesus resists. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And the tempter leaves him until another opportune time. It's a whole other sermon in there, but... So why would it matter? Why would it matter if these temptations were more of that, the the destructive type of temptation versus the, the ice cream type of temptation? Well, because what it does is it reminds us of the reality of who Jesus was. We affirm as followers of Jesus that Jesus was at the same time fully human and fully divine at the same time. And in this story, if there's no depth of of real sense of of temptation, the the human side isn't coming through with Jesus. If Jesus wasn't legitimately tempted to turn that rock into a piece of bread, how is the human side of Jesus at work? If Jesus isn't tempted to make that quick fix, to fix all the problems of the world right then and right there, and go away from the thing that's going to fix it for the long term, Sorry, the human response is, I can do something about this right now. And if at this point of ultimate despair, exhaustion, weakness, tiredness, maybe even delusionalness, Jesus isn't ready to just give it all up, is the human really there? What I love about thinking about the story in this way is it reminds me that when temptation comes in my life, that Jesus has been there. That when I think of the person of Jesus, to know that he was able to overcome those temptations and the others that would come in his life. It reminds me that in the power of God, I can do the same. In this season of Lent, often it is a season of making a choice, of giving something up or starting some new commitment. Lenten discipline, as it's often called. And usually what happens is for the first couple, maybe the first week, first two weeks, not a problem. But after a little while, that temptation is, is back of, you know, you can just stop and go and, you know, go buy that piece of cake. Or just don't do that volunteer work today. Whatever that discipline might be. What this story reminds me is that even though those temptations come, we can't overcome them because Jesus first did. And not just for Lent, but for every moment of our lives. That we can overcome those temptations. That even if they're, they're not just the, the ice cream temptation, but they're those really deep ones, those destructive ones that can lead to deep destruction in our lives. And the power of God, and the power of the community of God's people, You can overcome those temptations. I can overcome them. We can overcome them. So I pray that this story can help you to know the ways in which you are stronger than you know because of who God has made you to be and because of the power of God that is within you. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, be with us as we contend with our lives and all of our challenges. Thank you for listening as we bring before you the troubles that undermine us. We affirm, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Nurture and strengthen and sustain our families and our communities and the bonds between us. Inspire us to live with empathy and forgiveness. Help those struggling with work or facing uncertainty in their futures, that they may find peace in your abundant love. Jesus, our Redeemer, rescue us when we stumble. We proclaim, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Enable us to admit the temptations of the world and support us to resist turning away from your teaching. Awaken us to recognize the gifts you have given to each one of us and see the role we can play in healing your creation. Be with our leaders and those around the world that they may act with compassion and generosity. Guide them to humbly serve their own countries and to foster peace across all borders. And this day we remember especially the war in Ukraine and wars that rage in various places throughout the world. God, bring about peace. God, our creator, inspire us with renewed hope. We acknowledge it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deepen our faith to hear your word and to follow your way. Encourage us to bring all our hopes and desires to you in prayer, that in lifting up our souls to you, we may be shaped by your love. Help us to hear the dialogue of prayer and to listen in prayer as much as we speak. Comfort those who are battling ill health to bear their pain with patience, strength, and courage. Hear us as we pray for those in need of healing. Holy Spirit, our comforter, sustain us in times of trial. All this we pray, assured by your eternal love. Amen. As we come to the close of the service, uh, one thing I do want to note for next week, um, there will not be an online service or a normal online service. We'll have some music. Um, and a uh, short uh, devotional, um, but the guest preacher that we will have next Sunday will not be able to get her sermon recorded uh, in time for uh, or before the Sunday uh, worship service, so, um, so we'll not have her sermon within the, uh, the, the actual service that will be posted online, so just a heads up for you for next Sunday. As you go out today, go out today knowing that you serve the one who's been tempted just as we are, and yet was able to fight against those temptations, to resist against those temptations, which gives us hope, at least gives me hope, I hope it gives you hope, <laughs> for when those temptations come in your life, to know that you have one that you can go to, who's been there, and who has overcome. Grace, peace, love, and joy be with you. In the name of God, the Creator, Jesus, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, the Sustainer. Amen.